Thanks for everybody that helped pull together and put on the conj. Um, it definitely shows this is an extremely fun and engaging event. Um, and it's definitely an honor to speak in front of a crowd in a community that I admire and respect so much. There's a lot of great faces here that I love seeing every year. So without further ado, I am Paul DeGrandis, and I'm going to be talking about production closure scripts. And uh, it's, just, it's really my uh, lessons learned from building and shipping production closure script applications. And I want to motivate the beginning of the talk with a question. Um, what makes closure great? So uh, this very handsome gentleman right there, uh, stunning, uh, said that closure manages risk better than any other technology. Indeed, uh, we see that closure is really built to tackle the systems and the complexity of the systems that we face today. Um, it's closure's opinions as a language, its features, its culture, its community. They're all driven towards uh, managing and minimizing risk and complexity. And it's closure's holy trinity of simplicity, power, and focus that are really the driving factors behind that. We all know this, of course. Um, but this question is interesting in the light of closure script. Do the advantages that we find in closure translate to the areas where closure script lives? Right? Nobody's really asked that question. Does closure script solve the same incidental complexities as itself new complexities? Is closure script actually a terrible idea and you can't really build stuff with it? Um, right? we, we haven't seen any real data or real stories about this. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to constantly come back to that question throughout the talk. We're going to look at a case study and some metrics around that case study. We'll look at some compelling uh, features or or ways you can use ClojureScript, um, as well as the risks for adopting ClojureScript in a production system, things that I got bit by. And then we'll go sort of through like a validation process, how I validated uh, whether ClojureScript was appropriate for my team and my project, and how you can evaluate ClojureScript and see if it fits your team or your project or your company. And then we'll sort of pull out and look at different options, strategies, and architecture decisions that you can make uh, because of closure and closure script that you can't really make with other systems. And we'll drill in on those architectures and look at things like code organization, software design patterns, other concerns in the small. Uh, so that's pretty much what we're going to do. And um, just on the surface, closure script has some really compelling features, uh, like you get proper namespaces and you don't have to deal with the idiosyncrasies of JavaScript. Right? Those two things alone, pretty compelling. And then there's these like meta reasons to adopt ClojureScript, right? Like people say JavaScript has reach. And what does that really mean though for ClojureScript? Well, here's IBM ThoughtWorks technology radar from October of this year, just a month ago. And there you see it's advised you adopt Clojure, which is pretty cool because now we're being told that we can get into the enterprise. And I guess Neil Ford's probably excited that he generated this exact graphic. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then here are all the things that are related to JavaScript. So just because closure script exists, we can inject closure into the conversation of all of those pieces on that technology radar. So we went from one little blip to cascading across the entire technology radar, and we can go ahead and start dominating all of those areas if we want to. But I want to talk about two other features I really like about closure script, and they're not super obvious, and they're not uh, particularly sexy, but there's, they make real impact. And that's uh, closure as a data format, right? using Eden or the serializable chunk of Clojure as a data format has baseline advantages over JSON, right? You can capture things like keywords, sets, things that you just can't capture in JSON. But with reader literals, uh, the notation can be extended into your problem domain. You can capture the real intent of the data in your problem domain because you're using Clojure as a data format. And, um, and that means a lot, right? When you don't have that, what, what's the outcome? What do you have to do? So, you end up encoding all of these special meanings inside of JSON, and then you go through what I call the double parse dance, which is you take a JSON string and you parse it, and then you have all this logic and machinery to parse it again to pull out all this special meaning. It's total nonsense, and it's just incidental complexity that we've become accustomed to. But with reader literals, that whole problem goes away. It doesn't even exist anymore. And that has, that has pretty serious impact. Um, closely related to this is the reader, and closely related to the re reader is the printer. And this is one of the reasons why homo-iconic language, languages rock so hard, right? I can serialize anything and ship it around. I can change the relationship of where I want to put data and where I want to interpret that data. Um, so what does a closure function take in, right? Closure data. And what does it return? Closure data. And that closure function itself, well, that's just closure data. So having closure script in all of these places that JavaScript has reached means I can start shifting around those relationships however I need to solve my problem. 
Um, this leads to a very cooperative interop between Clojure and everywhere that JavaScript has reach because of Clojure script. So when you combine these two things with uh, proper namespaces and macros, you render a system like Meteor.js completely obsolete. Right? Here's a company that had to raise over $11 million to approximate the technology that Clojure and ClojureScript are giving you out of the box. If one of your goals in developing a production system is ensuring that you can always outmaneuver your competition, well, this is a pretty good start, right? This is flexible. You can apply it however you need to. But more interestingly, we're seeing that uh, some of the advantages that we find in Clojure are translating to ClojureScript, right? We're solving similar incidental complexities, but we're also solving a whole new set, right? Tossing uh, problem domain data back and forth has real representation. Um, so if complexity breeds complexity, well, Clojure Script's a good way to start removing some of that. But let's see what kind of impact that has on a real project. So the uh, system here is the exact same system between both of these stacks. It's a very simple web interface on top of a search application. There's a uh, role-based authorization going on on both of these stacks. The same team built both of the stacks. Um, and there's great library support, obviously, for both stacks. So the first stack is written in Python and JavaScript. It's deployed on top of Nginx that's acting as a reverse proxy, so it's shooting out to a bunch of application instances. The server side alone is uh, 17 Python classes. It holds 56 functions. It took one month to get to a feature-complete, usable prototype, and it took three months to ship a production system. It was later ported over to Clojure and Clojure Scripts that's deployed on top of Jetty. The server side alone is four namespaces and nine functions. If we throw in the Clojure script just for the sake of it, that only goes up to eight namespaces and 21 total functions. It took one week to get to a feature complete usable prototype that we were iterating on and one month to ship a production system. Now, I mean, the, this example is not huge, but it is the baseline example for a web system you would build. It has roles, it has user accounts, it does some action like searching and showing search results. So this is definitely a great candidate to try ClojureScript out on. Interestingly enough, the average cyclomatic complexity per function uh, is consistently lower on the Clojure and ClojureScript side. Uh, and at some points in the heaviest piece of business logic, specifically around roles, it's almost an order of magnitude lower on the Clojure and ClojureScript side. Um, so serious impact there. But we're seeing that uh, any measure of sort of complexity that you take, uh, how long it takes to grow the system, how long it, how big the system is, the maintainability of the system, the branching complexity of the system, it's consistently simpler on the closure and closure script side. And th that has obvious benefits if you're shipping production systems, but there's also some not so obvious benefits to this effect. In a recent paper published called Software Needs Seatbelts and Airbags, um, a study was concerned, or wanted to investigate, rather, if Capers Jones's uh, case study still held, if we're still seeing the same number of defects in systems. And despite our best advances in uh, unit testing and static analysis, at least for Java and C++ projects, the defect removal efficiency before delivery is still 85%. Right? So we're going into production with our systems with 15% defects still in there the total cost of repairing the remaining 15% is approximately, on average, one-third your total budget and one-third your total schedule still. The study still found that Capers Jones's numbers are pretty accurate. And the study goes on to conclude that the major root cause to the remaining 15% incidental complexities. For C++, that's manual memory man management. Um, and it was a great study, but what we're seeing is that uh, the intuition and the insight in the tar pit paper, we're seeing real numbers behind that. Like, this has real impact for production systems. And we're not going to change that 15% anytime soon. That's going to involve process change and tooling change and approach change. But we can make it 15% of eight total defects instead of something like 15% of 80 total defects. Right? And these are convincing reports, and the paper is very good. I suggest you dig it up. Um, but the benefits have to be weighed against the risks, and they are, uh, there are risks to develop or adopting ClojureScript. So ClojureScript is young. It's just over a year old by a couple of months. Um, the development cycle for ClojureScript is extremely fast and really, really short. Uh, that's because David Nolan, I don't think he sleeps, and uh, I do my best to keep up as well. 
And uh, so if you, if you work for an organization or you're on a development team where you need to lock in that dependency and it can't change, like maybe ClojureScript just is not the fit for you because you're going to want to keep updating the changes that are important. You'll find that um, as you use ClojureScript and you sort of push it to its limits, there will be missing protocols or missing library support. That's the most common problem right now that you'll find is you go to use something and uh, there's just no protocol implementation for what, whatever you're trying to use. Um, Metadata tends to get a little tricky at certain parts. Um, but that's super easy to fix, right? Because the decision was made to implement the majority of ClojureScript in protocols, you can fix that problem directly in your project if you need to. So there are ways around this. Um, highlighted at another talk was the exceptions. Now, I don't think the exceptions are that bad. But the caveat is you really do need to have JavaScript knowledge to understand what's going wrong when you see an exception. And there's no way around that right now. And I don't think there will be. But if you really want to understand the exception, you have to really understand what's going on with the JavaScript. Um, and closely tied to this, the, de the debugging story for ClojureScript is fairly weak or non-existent. And you're, it depends on how you interpret that. But um, the best combination that I've found is a combination of browser REPL to hold some stuff together and investigate, and just using the debugging tools in the browser, so Firebug and Firefox, or Chrome Developer Tools and Chrome. Again, though, in order to really debug your ClojureScript application, you need to have knowledge of JavaScript and the tooling around it. Um, so you need to be aware of that. The interactive development that you have come to love in Clojure does not translate 100% over to the environment in ClojureScript. The browser REPL is pretty cool, um, but it, it's, it's not going to be the experience that you are probably expecting. This is not really a problem in my opinion. When I develop a Clojure script application, I would say about 70% of that application is actually written in Clojure using my Clojure environment. And only when I'm doing something browser specific or node specific have I switched my environment up to be Clojure script specific. Um, and I, I think that, that works out great for me. You'll also find um, some oddities. They're not really necessarily problems, but there are oddities in developing Clojure script applications. Like, the Google Clojure library is written in two very distinct styles. And it's not really a problem once you realize that there are two styles to the libraries, but um, there are two styles. And so you might get caught up in figuring out, am I dealing with you know, a chunk of the library in style one or in style two? Um, so those are the risks that I really think um, exist in adopting ClojureScript. And you need to sort of evaluate these trade-offs with the benefits. Um, so you got to go through some sort of validation phase, right? And you, you just have to ask yourself a couple of questions. And the questions are pretty simple, like, uh, whew, I don't know why that got dark, but is this good for the company, right? No, don't ask that question. Um, what are the quality attributes that you're really shooting for, right? Uh, is there some expectation for the latency of the system? Or, how long it takes to get things back and forth in the system, or the throughput, right? Or the encryption, does something need to be encrypted? And if so, how strong and when? Or the security, do you need role-based authorization or not? Um, and then what about the adaptability? What are the expectations on how often you need to change that system or modify that system? Or the evolution of the system, right? Like how long does this system have to run for? Is it only gonna be around for a year? Is it gonna be around for 10 years? Um, those things matter, especially uh, if you're going to be adopting a technology that's going to be growing as you're adopting it. And what about the system constraints, the actual functional requirements of your system, right? What, what types of data do you have to handle? What is the data specific to your problem domain that you have to model? Or what interface are you expected to build? Is there an API involved or not? Um, what about deployment? What's the story around deployment? Or are you limited to only certain types of technologies, right? Can you only use certain types of technologies in your organization? And then just take a huge step back or fall into a hammock of your choice if you won one. And um, ask yourself, what's your biggest problem? What's the biggest thing standing in the way between you and shipping something today, right now? Um, and really capture that. Write that down. And, uh, and write down where you're wasting most of your time and most of your money and where you're making most of your money. Right? If money is your measure of success, for some people that might not be. But you know, where are you spending your resources? And where are the areas that you're sort of uncertain about stuff, or you seem like it's fuzzy, or you're a little scared of it, or whatever, right? Write down where the risks are happening. And uh, I'm sure you're writing it down, because if you don't double face palm, uh, and you don't want to let Picard down like that, and Riker, poor Riker. Um, 
And then just ask yourself why, right? Why would I use ClojureScript to solve this problem? What does it give me? Why not use technology X or something else? Um, find that trade-off, find that balance. If you have a hard time answering why for ClojureScript, flip it around, answer why not. Use the power of inversion and see if that helps you find those answers. You need to ask yourself why three times in a row. This trick works great, so I'm sharing it with all of you. So ask yourself why three times, and the answer to that third why is the real answer that you're looking for, and it should loop back to a quality constraint. I will give you a real example. So why close your script? Well, I need namespaces. Okay, well, why do you need namespaces? Well, namespaces help with organizing, managing, and sharing code. It's also a lot easier for newcomers to come along and sort of see how the project is connected and sort of work through the project. Okay, well, why is that important? Well, our biggest pain point is uh, maintaining projects. We don't have a problem shipping projects. We can ship projects, but our projects has to, have to last a long time. They, they, they live for over 10 years, right? And um, we're constantly rotating teams and rotating on projects, so we really need to optimize for ramping up on a project. Perfect, those are all quality constraints, right? Those are all quality attributes you want to shoot for. So this is a real reason for adopting ClojureScript. If you don't get to that third why, it's not a real reason. Start on something else. <clears throat> so do that, right? And this should sound pretty familiar. It's just a slight different interpretation of the hammock-driven development, right? You're just asking yourself these questions to really validate your understanding and your learning. And let's see how this gets applied in a real system, right? Let's take a hypothetical architecture of that case study. So, Here's a really simple box and line architecture. And I, the architects in the room, if there are any, are like crying that this is not a standard diagram of whatever. But um, it gets the job done, right? So a request comes in, it hits this web server that's acting as a reverse proxy that's shooting out to a bunch of application instances. Those instances are fetching data from a DB or a Datomic or whatever, you know, it doesn't really matter. And then they're mashing it together with a template to build some responses, and those responses are going back. And, um, this is cool, it gets the job done, responses are hitting clients, except that the traffic for this site is extremely spiky, and uh, the spikes are not predictable, and at the top of these spikes of traffic, we can't handle the read load, right? It's probably due to this unnecessary dynamism, um, the data's not changing that much, and the templates aren't changing that much, but we constantly have to recalculate all of these templates for every response. The biggest uh, pain point, the biggest problem is this design to template dance. Um, so these designers that we have generate this beautiful HTML and this beautiful CSS, and then it, it gets shipped to us developers, and we have to spend all of this time churning through it to turn it into a template and lace all this template logic through it before we can actually use it in a production system. So it's just a, it's a big pain. Um, we waste most of our time on constant SEO updates from business operations. Business operations always come into us, banging on our door, saying we need to change something for SEO purposes. And that's because that's where we're making most of our money also. Uh, we make our money from organic search leads coming into the site. Um, a year ago for this uh, hypothetical site, um, mobile traffic made up 12% of all total traffic on the site. And currently at this point on the hypothetical site, it makes up 25% total traffic. So mobile is growing extremely fast. It's the fastest growing segment. Um, but we're not really doing anything about it, right? These are our problems. These are the things that we really need to solve. So what do you do, right? What's the first thing that we do? And any web developer that sees this problem just says like, oh, well, let's just cache, right? Let's just handle the read problem for right now. We'll take all the static resources. We'll shove them into a CDN. We probably should have done that to start with anyway. We'll go ahead and cache some stuff. Uh, that's really helping, right? We, we can handle all this read load now. Except we still have that design to template dance. We, we haven't even done anything to approach that problem. And there's still constant SEO updates. Mobile's growing faster. We're not doing anything about it. Even though there's a cache here, that unnecessary dynamism problem is still there. We're just band-aiding it with a cache, right? We're just sort of masking it. We're not really getting around it. But worse, we've introduced a new problem. And it's a pretty serious problem. We've introduced serious cognitive load. Every single, single time a developer has to jump into this site, they have to think, oh, uh, is this defect happening because of the cache or not, right? Or does this new feature need to in invalidate something in the cache or not? So let's take a step back. Let's totally scrap this. This is nonsense. We're doing things that are, don't even make sense. Let's take the lessons from our community. Um, what if we just assumed immutability, right? This is like riches number one. So what if we assumed immutability? Uh, what if we baked the entire site? 
and it was completely static. And during the baking phase, we pulled in all of this SEO content from a third-party data store. And since we're on Clojure now, we, let's just assume Clojure and Clojure Script. Um, why don't we use something like in live, right? Then we can take the raw HTML and the raw CSS. We can go ahead and use it directly from the designers. So that goes directly into production. And since everything is static, we can shove everything into a CDN. And we can change the DNS A name record for www to point to the CDN. So now almost all of the site is being served directly out of the CDN. But we've introduced a new problem, and that's user experience, right? You, if you saw a site that was static and littered with SEO-specific content, and you couldn't really do much with it, and it didn't feel vibey, um, you would know. It would be a terrible experience. So how do we fix that problem? How do we fix the problem where things actually do have to be dynamic? Well, we can use ClojureScript. And we'll use and focus on ClojureScript and reuse all of those pieces of HTML that are still living in the CDN. Right? And then we can make parts of our site dynamic. And, uh, so this is pretty cool. So far, we're fixing a lot of these problems that we have. And during the baking phase, we can also optimize for mobile. We'll just go ahead and do that while we bake. Um, so we fixed that list. Uh, but we can do a little bit better. Let's pull things apart, right? Here's lesson number two from the community. Pull things apart. What if we just pull that search server right on out? We can get rid of that. And the results will go directly to the client. And we'll go ahead and reuse all of our dynamic closure script pieces and incorporate all of that. So this is all closure data now, right? My server's only going to serve up closure data for dynamic stuff. The search server is only going to serve up closure data to be incorporated. All of the problems go away because I'm choosing immutability for my site, and we're, we, we fixed all these problems. But we get a lot more too, right? This new decision can handle more read load. It can handle more write load. It was cheaper to operate for the hypothetical situation, and it was much quicker to modify. So we could incorporate changes a lot faster. The uh, outcome is clear, right? Question um, your habits. Question what you're actually doing. Investigate history. Um, assume immutability if that helps, and apply it. Whatever that means for your problem, apply it to the context. Um, pull things apart. Question what can be done here and what can be done there. Suddenly, we're playing around with the relationship of the dynamic logic being directly in the client um, and only serving up closure data. And, that, and that's very powerful. Um, so let's go ahead and just dive in on this. And we'll see how the code might be organized. Right? So I'm going to advise for the majority of applications, we stop choosing directories like CLJ and CLJS because they're not telling us anything. Right? Let's be architecturally evident with the way that we're organizing our code. And let's still apply the same good practices that we've previously applied and be resource oriented. So um, is that font super small for the majority of people? Yes. yes? Uh, sorry about that. But <laughs> <laughs> it's locked in. And you can read the slides after, hopefully. Um, but we should be architecturally evident. The more you blur the line between um, the client and the server, the lower that cognitive load becomes. Uh, and the more that you can use your code organization to uh, infer exactly how that system is holding together, um, again, that cognitive load comes way down. So if you look at just the top directory listing, uh, if you can see it, it says API, client, config, controllers, uh, routes, and server. Right? If you just saw that directory listing on a brand new project, you would have a pretty good idea on how that system probably holds itself together. And then if you look at the full tree, you'll see that uh, the client has flows, main, search, and a, a view directory. Right. So flows is symmetric to routes. Right? Flows declaratively uh, open up reactive data flows for the, for the client side, just like routes sort of map what's going to happen on the server side. So we're seeing symmetry between these two things. Um, uh, business logic on the server side is obviously tucked away into controllers, and business logic becomes first class on the client, because that's really what you're doing. You're doing raw business logic and manipulating data on the client. Um, so I think this is one approach to code organization. Um, again, just apply the same techniques that we're used to, right? Be resource oriented, um, and that will get you pretty far. Another thing I really like when I'm developing ClojureScript is uh, the use of protocols. And, um, 
this speaks really to the power of ClojureScript's implementation. And it was such a, a well uh, done design choice. Um, so we're all familiar with protocols. For those viewing at home, there's a wiki page. Um, read it first, pause the video. And um, here's why protocols rock. If you hit a bug, I said this earlier, but if you hit a bug in ClojureScript, it's probably because there's not protocol support for what you're doing, right? Like maybe something doesn't implement iSeq or some printing function or whatever, right? So you can go ahead and essentially monkey patch or fix that bug in your own code if you need to, right? You can always put that work around because um, the control is inverted, right? You get to decide who participates in a protocol and how. Uh, but this has great impact for the rest of the system. What if you want to make local storage um, look like a transient map? You can do it. You just have to extend those protocols to local storage. And if you extend the protocols for printing and reading those things to local storage, you can start shipping local storage around back and forth between the server and the client or multiple clients, whatever you want to do. Or what about cookies, right? Cookies should probably look like a transient map as well. So you can go ahead and do this, right? Let's Let's go ahead and make cookies look like a transient map. In fact, this is what um, one third of the shore leave libraries actually do. It's just all of these constant protocols that we ran up against. Like, I don't want to actually deal with the Google Closure libraries the way they're written. I want to write closure code and go ahead and use higher order functions and map across stuff. And I want to ship things around back and forth. Well, you can do that because protocols. Um, and protocols are also really great at just capturing the core abstractions that you want to model your system in, right? The lesson here is Shoreleaf's PubSub. So Shoreleaf specifies two protocols, one called Message Bus and one called Publishable. And if you fulfill either one of those protocols, you can go ahead and define whatever kind of message bus you want for your system. And anything can participate in the PubSub system. So you can publish from function to function, function to atom, Atom to worker, worker to function, any combination that you want. Those are the ones I've provided you, but um, you can go ahead and mix and match whatever you want. And then you can start building these reactive data flows just because you have two protocol implementations or specifications. Um, what falls out for the quality attributes of the use of protocols is adaptability and modifiability. Um, people are often trying to go after that when developing their systems. But what falls out concretely in the code is that you have very loosely coupled code and that the control is inverted. Um, for instance, in reducers, you don't say, I know how to fold all of these collections. You go to the collection and you say, you fold yourself. If you fulfill that protocol, you go ahead and do it. Um, so this has profound effects on building actual systems. Another tip I would suggest when building um, Closure script applications in production is if it's too hard to do in the client, go ahead and fall back to the server. Um, I definitely agree that Ajax is sort of a hack, right? It's sort of like a something you need to carefully consider. But there's real power. Again, I apologize for the small font. But there's real power in having the ability to, at any moment that you hit a roadblock in the client, you just go ahead and fall back to the server. So the example highlighted here is we needed to send emails. Um, to a bunch of people, and the email addresses are sort of encoded inside of this page that we're looking at. So how would you do this, right? Well, it's easy. I'm just going to go ahead and grab all of those emails on the client side and then ship them over, and because of macro magic, this looks like a local function call, right? But what's really happening underneath is that there's CSERF protected and role-based authorization to send email. So that's closure data to the server. The email gets sent out through Mailgun. The response comes back as closure data, and we treat it like closure data. So I'm sending a map closure data. I'm sending that whole thing over to the server closure data. Everything comes back closure data, and I can react on it. I can do whatever I need to do with it. Um, so be lazy. If something's too hard in closure script, you either need to extend a protocol, or you need to fall back to the server and get the job done. Um, that's just my advice if you want to ship real systems. Uh, also, this isn't JavaScript. I think too often uh, the trap for ClojureScript is that people want to apply all of these technologies or all of these lessons learned from JavaScript to ClojureScript. And ClojureScript is more Clojure than it is JavaScript. If you treat it that way, your solutions will be better. You'll feel better about yourself in the end. You need to treat it like Clojure. Just 
we already know the problems that exist in JavaScript. Let's not repeat them. Um, so uh, I'll give you an example. There, if you're developing a Node application, you're constantly dealing with callbacks. And uh, one potential problem with callbacks is that you stop programming with values. And when exceptions happen, they're not happening um, in the context you actually expect them to happen. And you can't handle them when you want to handle them. So promises, right? Stack promises at the front of your Node application. Figure out all the things you depend on, and then program with values through the rest of uh, your, your program. And that has worked out great on Node applications. Um, in the browser, I try to throw callbacks as far to the end of the calling chain as I can, and so much so that I will use the threading macro and basically build up all my values, and at the very end becomes like this special callback that does something. Um, that is a great way to get around this. Program with values. Apply all of the lessons and the techniques you use for Clojure to Clojure Script. Um, and when you're not doing that, question why you're really not doing that and start to shape your program in a way to allow you to do that. So here's the quick tip list. Um, you know, these are all the things that I sort of said. We're not going to go through them again. But I do want to say one thing as I close here. And that's the more people adopt ClojureScript, the better and better it's going to get. And the more sort of problems we're going to solve with ClojureScript, it's really important for participation to happen. Um, I really firmly believe in ClojureScript. And my, my goal in doing this presentation was to give a slide deck that somebody can take to a VP of engineering or to a decision maker and say, look, here are some hard numbers. Here are some metrics. Here are some techniques. Maybe we should try ClojureScript. Um, and, I, and I really encourage you to do that, whether it's a hobby project or something in production. Um, so without that, I've got a couple of minutes for questions, comments, concerns, anything. Yes, one of you. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, there are two styles in the Google Closure Library. Can I give you a description of them? And um, they revolve around how constructors are made and the naming semantics inside of the Google Closure Library. Um, again, those are not hard problems to get around, but you need to be aware that for some files, the constructor is named and the same as the file name and is a top-level entity. So it gets weird when you start requiring it or you start needing to use it in the system. Um, the other style, that's, that's buried. There's, there's usually like a making function or a generation function. And there is no top-level entity that's going to get in the way of a require statement or whatever for the constructor. Yeah, the next question. Mm -hmm. Um, so the question was, uh, when you start pushing more stuff into the client, you need to start versioning the APIs that are being exposed to ship closure data from the server to the client, um, and specifically, like, that the data might change throughout specific versions. Um, the question went on to say, is there anything in Clojure or Clojure script that makes that easier? I think Clojure as a data format it naturally helps with this problem, but also, uh, I find in the hypothetical situation, again, that it's easier to get around that by versioning your CDN correctly. And so you serve up CDN version stuff, and that CDN version stuff calls the server stuff. Um, again, for the baseline web system that you would write, it's so small in Clojure and ClojureScript that unless you were developing a gigantic system of huge, like over 10 namespaces, I would just leave all of the API calls in there and support all the versions. But um, unless that has serious impact on your system. Question way in the back. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, right. So the question is, if you have a lot of legacy JavaScript, um, the story becomes very different for adopting Clojure Script. Um, yeah, it definitely is very, very different for doing that. I, I honestly do not have a good answer. My answer was that seemed so daunting and backwards, and I wanted the semantics of Clojure that I just tossed the JavaScript stuff away. But if you looked at how small that project was, like tossing it 
away is not a big deal. I can do, it took me one week with the team of three other people, one week, to get to feature complete. I had feature parity on both systems. So unless you have a huge JavaScript system that you want to replace with ClojureScript, which you may or may not want to do, right? You've invested a lot in that JavaScript, and it's probably hairy, and it's got a bunch of weird hacks in it. Um, but I would, uh, I have no good answer for integrating ClojureScript into JavaScript. I would just not touch the JavaScript. It's like a disease. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. How do I handle differences between browsers? This question got asked at the bar last night, and I felt like my answer was more colorful, colorful because of the alcohol. But um, here's how I handle multiple browsers. Google Clojure does a pretty good job at handling that problem, as long as you hit the right libraries that you know reach far enough back to whatever browser you need to support. Um, for certain applications, this, is, this should be one of the concerns on the slides. For certain applications, we just said, no IE. We'll use, we'll use Chrome Frame, no IE. Um, and that was our way around it. And that was acceptable because we knew our customers very, very well. And we knew that that was an acceptable thing. Um, our, our market share is very small in IE, and putting Chrome Frame into IE is an easy solution for us to get around. Uh, but it, it really depends. This is one of those things that you have to balance yourself against when developing ClojureScript applications. But the Google Clojure library uh, helps out a lot. Yes, that is true, yeah. Yes. So yes, the core library is completely cross-browser. But if you're developing a serious application, you're going to want to bang on probably HTML5 things. Um, and that's when you get into some hairy issues. Um, it, it's trivial to do. You need to. The question was, what is the interrupt story with other JavaScript libraries? It's pretty trivial to do. Um, in some cases, it's uh, writing an externs file for the Google Closure library and then just creating the right abstraction that you need inside of your code to call the actual JavaScript code. It, it just turns into regular JavaScript calls like you would do for interrupt stuff. Um, I tend not to do that a lot because Google Clojure, the library, gives me almost everything that I need. And then whatever I don't need is actually just me writing protocols to do it in Clojure, the Clojure way. Um, any more questions? I have maybe one more that I can take. And if not, that's totally fine. All right, thank you very much. Oh, wait. Yeah, I'll talk to you later. Thank you very much for those who clapped. <laughs>